If you've never been to the Contemporary Art Galleries in New York before, I'm about to blow your mind. Not only are there paintings and sculptures, but some of the most unique experiences on the planet for a limited time for free if you know where to find them. It's my pleasure to seek them out and share them on my website and private gallery tours, but because summer is the off-season, I thought I'd take this opportunity to take a look back at my top 10 favorite shows of the last 10 months. In the fall, the Marble Gallery hosted the most ambitious and deceptive exhibition of the year by artist duel Jonah Freeman and Justin Lowe. You entered the apparently small gallery, no larger than a couple parking spaces, with a few decent paintings and a janitor closet with a door temptingly ajar. Enter, and you would find a janitor closet connected to a bathroom, which led you to another bathroom through the shower into a strange hallway, down the hallway, and through a busted wall into an off-track bedding parlor, into the dark hallway of a boiler room, past a creepy crystallized electrical room, up the stairs to a creepier plastic surgery office, down the stairs into some kind of bodega from another planet with something called nerve splicing lubricant, past a cake shop, and into an Upper East Side library where they modified every single book cover, which tossed you back into this hallway with two simultaneous thoughts. What I want to do that again. Was that? Meanwhile, another doorway awaited you at the Murray Guy Gallery on the second floor where artist Zoe Leonard presented some blurry photos of the sun, but beyond that, an empty dark room with only a tiny circular window made from a lens. The secret here was to wait five minutes for your eyes to adjust and pick up light from the sun hitting the streets of New York, streaming through the gallery and focusing itself live in full color, upside down and in reverse on the gallery walls. You would watch taxi cabs flicker across the ceiling as Zoe Leonard transformed the gallery into a walk-in camera obscura. But when you left, those photos that you forgot about, your pupils are now so dilated that they pleasantly burn your retina like you're actually looking at the sun. But just when you think you're done, you exit the gallery about where I'm standing to find the same view you were looking at inside the gallery, this time real and right side up. But because you've been looking at it so long in the gallery, real life feels upside down. There's irony in art that can poke your eye out, and sculptor Leonardo Drew threatened to do just that at the Second Ben Jenkins Gallery behind me also this fall, where thousands of wood scraps projected themselves off the walls in multiple sculptures as you were guided and pressed dangerously close by this massive burnt wall of debris. A massive storm almost 1,000 miles wide. This is going to be a big and powerful storm. With the destructive power of an atomic bomb. A natural disaster of extraordinary force strikes the northeast coast of the United States. I've uh, never witnessed anything like this. Oh my God! On 22nd Street, behind me, is one of the only remaining flood lines left on a building. Uh, this is now nine months old, about five feet tall. Appropriate that possibly the most inspirational artist in history reopened immediately after the flood. Chuck Close's massive portraits made from impossibly imaginable abstract shapes and color combinations that wouldn't make sense to a computer but somehow do in your brain when you stand back. An oil on canvas, a new technique of digitally aided watercolors that in a nutshell he made a mark, uh, scanned it, and then printed it with watercolor paint on watercolor paper in only three colors, magenta, cyan, and yellow. Their transparency is what adds up to that final color. And very large tapestries uh, that feel incredibly three-dimensional from black and white thread. Also opening immediately after the flood, one of the most disturbing shows of the year and awesome at the Gladstone Gallery, Wan Yang Ping presented a room full of headless animals. A lion, a horse, a bobcat, a rat, a wolf, a deer, all real and approachable within inches, unlike a natural history museum. And when you did, you found yourself under this ominous marionette hand while a question itched at your brain. But where are the heads? You would find the answer upstairs where every single one was stacked on a skewer from bull to rat. One month later, the most beautiful thing I saw all year was at the Luring Augustine Gallery, the artist Ragnar Kjartansson filmed nine musicians in nine different rooms of the same house 
playing simultaneously for one hour straight. They could not see each other, but they could hear each other through those earphones, creating some of the most incredible music that only came together in the gallery. Every screen has its own audio track, so as you walked around the gallery, you could remix those volume levels. Running simultaneously was another musical piece, this one live at the 303 Gallery by Doug Aiken. He jackhammered out the gallery floor, filled it with water, installed underwater microphones, which broadcast precisely controlled drips from the ceiling and a kind of an aqua drum beat that ran throughout the length of this show. Now you'll notice behind me the gallery has been torn down. The most amazing part of the show was one week after it officially closed, Doug Aiken hired musicians, not construction workers, to tear the inside of the gallery down in rhythm with the drips from the ceiling that were still running. But listen, no one's got nothing on the robotic genius that is Daniel Rosen's mirrors on view at Bitform's gallery. You walk into the gallery already amazed by these uh, little yellow sticks, each on individual motors, that goes through this mesmerizing screensaver of sorts. But to get within about eight feet, and the whole thing halts, and then mimics you in real time, there's a little tiny camera hidden in the middle of this that's looking at you, translating you into pixels, and doing that. But if you turn the corner here, there's another one composed of 153 fans. What I like about this one, besides the obvious is uh, the sound, like a flutter of bird's wings as your movement opens and closes these fans. But pushing art farther into the future than I've ever seen was Shane Hope at the Winkleman Gallery, who created these meticulous alien abstract wall sculpture things on a 3D printer, which essentially melts plastic down to a tiny thread and then builds it up. The shapes he created on a modeling software used by scientists to invent uh, nanomolecules in this new theoretical, experimental, but totally possible technology that we will someday be able to engineer and modify matter at the molecular level. Uh, but like all great art, understand none of it. And it is still amazing. And finally, the most talked about show of the year. Love him or hate him. Famous and infamous. Prince of the art world. Jeff Koons was actually two shows. At two galleries, David Zwerner contained plaster copies, exact copies, of Greek and Roman sculptures with glass gazing balls attached, essentially reducing the most respected objects in art history to the most expensive lawn ornaments. But the most amazing thing was an inflatable snowman and a set of mailboxes, both that looked like they were spray painted white, but were in fact extremely heavy, extremely fragile, 100% solid white plaster. And it got more spectacular, for better or worse, at the Gaugosian Gallery five blocks north where Koons presented paintings painted by real human beings with a real brush, but from inches away looked like photographs. Also, the Incredible Hulk made from painted bronze, not inflatable plastic, I will say that again, painted bronze. And this gorilla carved from black granite and his most famous massive, extremely heavy, candy-colored balloon animals made from polished stainless steel. The auction record for one of his balloon sculptures is about 35 million, and that exhibition, along with every other, was free to see and less crowded than any museum in the world. What I'm saying is that if you're comfortable coming out here on your own, check out the 2%.com for all of my recommendations, really exploding when the season starts in September. But if you want to come out here with me and also learn about the awesome architecture in the neighborhood, including the wood impression concrete masterpiece by Annabelle Seldorf behind me, email me, david at the 2%.com. Tours are already starting to get booked up for September, so get on that. Either way, get out here. But you don't always have to look up to find cool stuff. Drip graffitied on the sidewalks throughout New York is the portrait of Arthur Rambeau. French 19th century child prodigy poet, there's one, and there's another one, played by Leonardo DiCaprio in the 1995 pre-Titanic movie Total Eclipse. Just a little one. In Chelsea, they're centered around 22nd Street. There's a big one. But keep your head down and you will discover them mysteriously and awesomely throughout Manhattan. Whatever you do.